be hard somehow blind I can never find what I was searching for Disciples are responding to the need right now in the current crisis. Wendy and Carly Hammond have been masked for their local school district staff who are distributing over 20,000 meals daily. Cheryl Edwards and her 91-year-old father, Dwight Goins, have made also hundreds of masks to distribute to local firefighters and different healthcare professionals. And our IE Hope chapter, along with Emma Pineda, have made 5,000 masks for local hospitals. God is also working powerfully by drawing people near to him. Veronica Martinez was baptized on Good Friday and Jasmine Roscoe was restored on Easter Sunday. God is so good. In the midst of this pandemic, our best use is baptisms. Just a few days before social distancing orders began, Maria Huerta, who works for the San Gabriel School District, was baptized on March 10th. On March 23rd, Denny Bethencourt completed his studies virtually and was baptized by his recently baptized roommate. On March 29th, Paul Trevino was baptized in our Glendale Young Professionals Ministry. His girlfriend at the time is now also studying and wants to be baptized. On March 4th, Cindy Rodriguez, wife of new Christian Jose Miranda, was baptized. Then, this past weekend, Aida Ruiz, mother of new Christian Joshua Ruiz from the Spanish Millennials Ministry, was baptized. And Carly Rodriguez, daughter of Martina and Sandra Rodriguez, was baptized in our teen ministry. Summer going to senior year, I found out my dad had cancer, and then three months later he passed away. At that point, I like realized what what was there, and I realized I wasn't living my life the way I should. And, and what is your good confession? My good confession is that Jesus is Lord. In the past three weeks, we've seen Martin Pineda and Dana Nuo baptized into Christ. We've seen our sister Kyung Hui restored to the fellowship. And currently we have over 40 people studying the Bible across all of our ministries in Orange County. It's been amazing to see various small groups and small business owners coming together to make encouragement packages and masks for local medical professionals. And to highlight a group of uh, single women in our congregation known affectionately in Orange County as the WOW Women, praying fervently for all of the needs inside and outside of our congregation. I'm excited to share with you how in the last few weeks, God's Spirit has moved powerfully and added nine new brothers and sisters into our fellowship. Chris Spencer, Diego Vargas, Ethan and Hayden Collarbaum, Michelle Lim, Gustavo Duarte, Diane Seri, Haley Gonio, and Luke Blakely. We're excited to see what God's Spirit continues to do. We are so proud of the singles ministry in our region. They are developing incredible momentum with their faith. They're hosting weekly Zoom prayer calls. They're meeting after every lesson throughout the week. And currently they have 17 Bible studies going on. And one of them recently was baptized during the quarantine. That's Shamika Enos. And now she is one of 30 that are attending the Young Christians class every Friday evening. In our campus ministry, they've been hosting Zoom Bible talks over the last three weeks. And out of that, two women are currently studying the Bible. We've been very fortunate also to open our temporary food bank that we've been able to serve people in need. Finally, we have seen two couples get married, Anthony and Kiana Day and Angel and Kristen Vasquez. Wanted to share with you about a woman named Madison who found us on Google. She found Jesus, she got baptized, then she shared her faith with a woman named Tina who worked at Starbucks. 
Madison then moved to Sacramento, but Tina months later decided she needed to find God. She came to church and she got baptized last Sunday. Just said, God, I want to thank you so much for this amazing and beautiful journey that you have taken me on. Because all my life, there's been a part of me missing. And now I know all along it was you. I finally listened. Finally, after all these years, I was able to hear you. Thank you for never giving up on me. You are amazing and loving, and I just feel so lucky. And I am yours. In your son Jesus' name, amen.
Morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Rivas. I'm a 28-year-old single from the new OC Coastline Ministry at Huntington Beach. Just wanted to take this moment to say hi to my Coastline family and to thank Pastor Steve for asking me to share my testimony, as this is my first time sharing. So prior to my decision to follow Christ, I met Kevin Springer in 2018. Met him at a tennis match I was working part-time. And while we were stretching in the tent, we got to talking to each other and instantly hit it off, uh, sharing our, our love for exercise, sports, and um, started talking about our faith. Uh, we decided to try and set up a date to study the Bible, and um, we even prayed together at the end, but it all fell through the cracks, and we eventually didn't study the Bible and lost touch for over a year. Uh, meanwhile, God was humbling my heart. On uh, 2017, I got a Master of Science degree in, at Texas State, and I moved to San Diego with my parents due to my dad being diagnosed with cancer. Uh, it was a tough living situation, and I told myself I'd never move in with my parents after college. Uh, but I did, because I loved my dad. And um, However, I, I grew entitled and restless, hungry for independence, and I was mind bottled because I wasn't scoring a job like my colleagues were. I found myself comparing myself to them and um, they didn't seem to have any issue finding a job and starting their adult lives. So I eventually quit social media uh, to stop comparing and my need for social validation. I was serving as a Wednesday night uh, small group worship leader and yet I was falling into the same sins that I felt or that I tolerated in college. This was drunkenness and immorality. I felt I was a chameleon in social situations, often um, camouflaging myself to just depending on the setting I was in. I was frustrated with failure to express myself honestly due to fear of rejection. I grew up in Christian church and Christian schools um, and everything in between from camps and youth groups. But I always felt I was too worldly for the church and too Christian for the world. I drifted from church attendance throughout college with a mindset to turn my life over to God after. Yet I couldn't escape my sinful nature after college. I lived in fear for every invitation to go out and party with coworkers and friends. It was a nightmare because in the past I, I've suffered from a DUI and other arrests for public intoxication. Probation and the law, probation with the law and my work license was now on the line now. One thing would often lead to another. Uh, often when I felt lonely, I, need, I wanted a need to socialize and uh, that meant binge drinking for me and which would lead to lust and immorality. Uh, it was filled with impure thoughts and shame. On the outside, it portrayed my life like nothing was wrong but on the inside, I was shamefully depressed of who I was. When I moved to Orange County, um, I was searching for a church home. Yet, uh, on my first week during my job, I was introducing myself to the coaches. And when I stepped foot on the tennis uh, court, I could see this really tall guy in a really bright neon suit. And I, I, could, I just felt like I recognized him. And as I got closer, it was Kevin Springer after a year of no contact and just not talking at all. We couldn't believe it. Uh, I took it as my sign of confirmation that God had something planned and destined for my life. So, and I, and I was eager to find out what that was. I started studying like I originally planned with him. I learned a lot about myself and more than ever about God. I learned that we must deny ourselves pick up our cross daily and follow him. I began to have a healthy fear of God, started to open up about my sinful nature, and I learned that godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation and has no regret. During one study, I was brokenhearted on the way I was living, the things I wanted to change that I couldn't, and the people I hurt along the way. I learned that when we participate in baptism, we participate in the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. 
So I decided to be baptized because I was fed up. I put it on the back burner too long. I finally understood what it represented. The opportunity was clearly open and I wanted to commit and stop living my life like a hypocrite. Growing up, I knew there was something significant about baptism, but I never committed because I didn't want to resort to my old ways of living. I was baptized, so on October 26, I was baptized uh, in 2019 at Huntington Beach in front of Tower 12 while the sun was setting. It was an epic scene I would never forget. I as I was submerged in the water, the sun was setting on the horizon like my old self was setting on new days ahead. The temptation didn't stop, but I was encouraged to find a new subtle power to resist it. And I know that power is the Holy Spirit. Currently, what I know now is nothing can separate us from God's love, that I'm his son, that he protects me, that he has good plans for me. And I want you to know that in John 10, 10, it says, the devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy but Christ came to bring us life to the full. And he loves us all and he died for all. So the, by, by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace is without no effect. And now I get to share how I overcome alcoholism and impurity through Christ. It's a new strength of, and freedom to share. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Also in Revelation 13, it says, uh, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And through these hardships, God has taught me to be content in all situations and to please Him rather than others. I'm constantly encouraged by the brothers and sisters at Coastline and how devoted they are walking with God and helping me along the way. I want to thank you so much for allowing me to share my testimony and I just hope that if you uh, are going through anything uh, that you can relate to in my story, uh, or maybe it's different, I just encourage you to reach out to one of your friends at the Church of Christ and um, just ask how you can get to know God and start studying the Bible. So with that, I just want to say God bless and enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning. Buenos dias, everybody. Great to be together this morning. I want to welcome you to our all LA service. And, uh, what a great time. What an exciting time. You know, we, so many extraordinary things are happening and you know, every region's been having their own services. And here we are all together sharing one service online. What a, what a, what a great thing that is happening this morning. And I want to welcome you, uh, welcome all the members of the different ministries out there across LA. Uh, welcome to our families that are watching wherever you are, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. It's great to have you with us this morning. We're going to have a great time studying one of the all-time classic stories in the Bible that uh, just has so much to say for each of us. And I think one of probably one of the most important stories. And I'll tell you about it in just a minute. You know, this is we're, we're in the really extraordinary times. And I, and I know that we're all going through a lot and we're praying a lot and we're connecting. And it's incredible how God has been moving during this time as we've been all staying at home, trying to stay safe, trying to stay secure. You know, we've changed a lot. You know, we used to count the week as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now we just say day and night, right? We used to have a certain image we always kept up. And now that image has changed for a lot of us at home. And we used to only wear masks once a year. And now we wear them everywhere. And even when we're outside having fun, you know, I mean, it's just the world has changed, changed dramatically. Who would have thought this? Who would have seen this other than maybe Bill Gates? But, but, uh, so much is happening out there and, and, and some incredible things are happening, but also some really scary things and some really bad things. Some things, uh, that are affecting people's lives and people, so many have lost their lives. So many are losing their businesses and aren't able to work. And there's just a lot of bad things out there happening. And I know that we are aware and we've been praying and hopefully that's drawing us closer to God and, and building us up spiritually so we can handle it all because you know, there is a lot of anxiety out there, a lot of fear out there. And for good reasons, not just, not unreasonable fears and not unreasonable anxiety, but reasonable, very real things 
that are scary out there. And that's, that's what's happening in this country, a developed country with many resources. You can only imagine what's happening in countries around the world where they don't have many resources and, 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 and they don't have doctors and nurses to go to. So please keep them in your prayers as well. And then we'll be doing a special collection to help our family around the world in just a few weeks, and you'll be hearing more about that. But today we're going to focus on studying one subject, the most important subject, and that is God. We're going to focus on God. And we only have a few minutes. It's a, it's a 20 minute sermon. So I'm rocking and rolling. That's why I'm talking so fast. I'd probably switch to Spanish and it'd get done even faster, but then you wouldn't understand. So we're, we're, we're studying God, you know, and God is, is the great mystery for most of the people on the planet. You know, most, very few people have a confident relationship with God. And that's one of the beauties, one of the great blessings of being a disciple of Jesus. You know, lots of different images about God, right? There's the classic kind of Zeus, kind of Santa Claus God. There's the, the angry God, the God of thunder and lightning who's waiting to zap everybody. There's the comical distant God who kind of pops in and out of history. There's the cool, easygoing Morgan Friedman God that a lot of us would like to know. Then there's the incredible God from the shack of God of compassion and understanding. And, but the most common one that I run into, and I think a lot of us run into out there is the unknown God, the God of of just, we don't know, you know, most people know very little about God. And unfortunately, oftentimes they know things that are not even true and they, and they believe things that aren't true about God. And, and that can get us in a lot of trouble. You know, we have this intrinsic understanding, this intrinsic view of God as our father, you know, and God presents himself as our father. That's the kind of relationship he calls us to have with him. And so oftentimes, you know, when we've had a great relationship with our dad here, you know, with our dad, our flesh dad, then, then we, we generally have a leg up on building a relationship with our father in heaven. However, it goes the other way too. When we've had a bad relationship with our father here, our parents here, we can also have a bad view of God in in heaven, or if we have no relationship. And there are many, unfortunately, many young men that, that don't meet their dads until they're adults. And so God is just tends to be a big mystery and it's a big issue. You can see it. You, you, it's, it's such a big issue on so many levels from education, psychology, confidence, uh, emotional well-being. Even Hollywood picks it up. I, I, I couldn't help noticing the Avengers and the, and, and the Justice League. Almost all of them have dad issues and things going on with their dads. And it's such an important role. And God presents himself to us as a loving father, or, or, or specifically today, we're reading Luke 15, the classic story called most of the time as the prodigal son, but really should be called the compassionate father, because that's really what the story is about. The star of this story is two people. One is God, the father, and the other is you and me. You know, somebody once said a parable is a story that you find out at the very end, you're the star of it. And, and, and this is one of the classic parables. And it's very purposeful, very intentional, because Jesus wants us to understand some key things about God. Things that we generally don't understand, or we doubt, or we don't believe, or we don't accept because of our own issues, or because of damage we've had in this life. We, we don't just absorb that. And we need to. And, 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 you know, I just, I just celebrated my 38th anniversary as a Christian. 38 years ago, I was baptized. And it has been such an incredible journey getting to know God, just getting to know Him and be secure in Him. And I've learned so much. And, and, and this is, there, there's nothing like a great relationship with God. There's also nothing so devastating as having the wrong image of God. Or having the wrong understanding. And that's how this story ends with Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You see, they had a very different understanding of God. And their understanding of God, God is the holy, righteous God. He's more like the one that was angry and waiting to zap people. 
And sinners are the first ones he wants to zap, which would be really bad news for you and I. He, 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 they, their God, their understanding of God is he has no patience. You better get it right and you better do it right or you're in trouble. Now, the truth is, truth be known, nobody does everything right. And the Bible even tells us that, that nobody's going to go to heaven because they did everything right. And nobody's going to do so many good deeds because they did everything right. We're all going to have to rely on God's grace and mercy and compassion to make it to heaven. And thankfully, God is a God of grace, mercy, and compassion. He's the God who loves. I remember I was speaking to a young man who, who was trying to come back to church. He, he showed up at church and he told me he had gone a couple of years ago to a church and he walked in and it was a church where he'd grown up. They knew him really well. They knew him and his you know, when he went off into the world and messed up his life and got involved in drugs and all this stuff, and he got involved in gangs. And, and when he walked in, everybody was shocked. And the preacher went up to him and said, what are you doing here? And he was horrified. And he turned around and he walked out. That's that God that none of us, none of us need to believe. That is not the God. That is not our God. That's not the way he is. It's our worst nightmare. Our worst nightmare is to be rejected, is to be thrown out, and of all people, by the Father, by God. And we so desperately need to understand how much God loves us. It's so important that we get it, that we accept it, that we, that we let it fill our hearts and give us the confidence and the power we need to live through this life, to live life as Jesus intended. So a life to the full. You cannot do that without God. I remember, I figured out as a young Christian, wrote it down in my journal. You cannot be godly without God. We really have to have a real relationship with him. We have to get to know him better and better. This chapter, it's really three stories, three stories that tell us what makes God happy. What fills God's heart with joy? At the beginning is the story of a lost sheep. And that story tells us how God will climb mountains, will go into ravines, will go high and low to find you. You can run, but you cannot hide. God is always calling you home. He's always reaching out to find you. And nothing makes him happier than to be with you and you to be with him. The second story is the lost coin, an accident that happens when we're not paying attention. We get lost. We drift. We, 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 we get what's called mission drift. We we're we're suddenly not where we thought we were and we're not living the life we thought we were living. When we get honest, we realize we're far from the father. And it's a woman who's high and low tears her house apart to find that coin. And then Like the other one says, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me because how great it is, how wonderful it is when she found her coin. And that's you and me, the lost coin. And then the last one, of course, is the lost son. And he says at the end of that one, let's have a feast and let's celebrate. This is when God just wants to have a party. He he wants to rejoice He wants, he's so happy. I mean, there's not many times that we're that happy where we're shouting, where we're saying, let's celebrate. It's when we win a championship or maybe our favorite team. You know, I I remember my son and I got to go to Barcelona and watch Barcelona play Madrid and they were winning and we were cheering and jumping up and down with the other 100,000 nuts that were at that stadium. There are a lot of things that make us that excited. I remember the birth of my kids. I was so, so excited. I, my heart just wanted to explode. I remember my wedding day. I mean, I just, I was walking on the air. I was shouting. I, I, I got up, I was, we were in Mexico City. I, I went out in the street and I shouted, thank you, God. I was so excited. I couldn't wait. And that's how God feels when any of us turns to him. When any sinner repents, and and understand this, a sinner who repents, that doesn't mean somebody who's a quote unquote non-Christian necessarily. Yeah, if you're out there and you're not walking with God and you don't know God, 
then come, ask, get help, find out, turn to him. But sometimes that's Christians too. That's, that's, that's disciples who've just drifted away. And we're not there anymore. We're not walking with God. We're going through the motions, but our hearts are far from him. And this is the warning that Jesus gave. They're ever seeing, but never perceiving. They're hearing, but not understanding. And we can go to church and sermons just bounce off our hearts. And if somebody tries to correct us or rebuke us, we do the matrix thing. We dodge the bullets. And somehow we remain unchanged. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about waking up, coming to our senses and being with God where our hearts are tender, where we can weep with God, where we can put, cast all our anxieties on him, where he helps us and gives us strength and give us, gives us the power to overcome things. So it's not just the person who doesn't know. In fact, the truth is in this story, the, the son knew the father. He knew him well. So verse 11 says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. This was horrible. I mean, first of all, he's, he's not even the eldest son, so he has no business asking for an inheritance at all, really. But then to ask for one while his father is alive, so disrespectful. I mean, you shouldn't even talk to your parents about what's going to happen when they die. And who's going to get what? And here he is bringing it to his dad, asking for his inheritance. And I'm sure the Pharisees and tax collectors are listening to this thinking, what a complete evil loser. And Jesus is setting him up. Yeah, this guy's out there. Really bad. And in verse 13, 14, it says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. And he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I mean, he just did a complete idiotic thing. Totally wasted, blew everything. Went to another country so people wouldn't even know who he was. And after that, he spent everything. There was a severe famine in that land. In the whole country, and he began to be in need. There's nothing like hunger to humble a man. There's nothing like desperation. And as anybody could have predicted, when you have money, you got lots of friends. And when you lose that money, you find out whether any of them are not are, are real friends. And they weren't. And he's alone and he's desperate. So desperate. Since he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. I mean... You got to remember, this is a Jewish young man. And he's out there feeding pigs. Pigs are unclean. You ain't supposed to be touching them, let alone feeding them. And he's so desperate that he wants to eat the pods that he's feeding them. And pods cannot be eaten by humans. You get sick and die. But that's how desperate he is. He hit rock bottom. And he says, when he came to his senses... Verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him. He finally comes to his senses. You know, when working with chemical recovery, we used to always have the saying that they haven't hit rock bottom yet. It isn't until a person hits rock bottom that they turn. And you hope that rock bottom isn't so far down that they've lost their job or they've lost their marriage or they've lost their family. You hope that rock bottom is somewhere before that point. But you know that they will not change and they will not take change serious and they will not turn to God. They will not come to their senses until they reach that point. He finally reached that point. For him, it was hunger. When he was so desperate, he was doing things that he never would have imagined himself doing. And he was hungry. And he finally came to his senses. And the question is always, how long does it take us to come to our senses? Somebody once asked me, why is it that you Christians always find God when you're down and out? 
So I just turned the question back to him. Why do you think that is? And he thought about it. He said, because we're prideful and stubborn. I said, yep. We tell ourselves, I can handle this. I can control this. I can overcome this addiction. Or I can, I can fix my marriage. Or I can fix my family. Or I can take control. Or I can fix this. Or I can do whatever. Until finally, it hurts too much and we come to our senses. Until too much damage is done. Or until too much life has gone by. And it didn't go the way we wanted it to. And too many dreams are shattered or fall apart. And we finally come to our senses and say, you know, maybe I do need God. Maybe I ought to read the Bible. Maybe I ought to get close to God. Or maybe I ought to stop being distant. Or maybe I ought to stop being half-hearted at church. Or maybe I ought to stop following Jesus from a distance and get up close and personal again. Because that's when the magic happened. That's when miracles happened. That's when all the incredible stories were in my life. And not just other people's lives. And so he turns to his father. And he's ready to turn himself in. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He wasn't pretending anymore. There was an ounce of pride left. He was completely humble. There's a Hebrew word that's really important here. It's shuv. It's a concept of turning around and facing God and just being real. God, I need you. I can't do this. I'm, I'm not pretending anymore. I'm not covering up my sin. I'm not acting like I know it all. I'm totally aware and confessing. I need you. And it's the point he reached. And so he got up and he practiced his little speech, went off to his father to humble himself before his father. And now you got to remember, Jesus is painting a picture here. He's painting a picture of what he wants you and I to understand about the father. He wants you to understand this about God Almighty. That this is the kind of God he is. This is about while he was still a long way off. Probably standing in a beautiful robe. He's a wealthy man. Nice sandals. Maybe he had Prada sandals, Gucci robe. Had some nice jewelry. Dignified man. What does he do? He takes off running. Running. Totally undignified for an older man. He didn't care. He loves his son. And his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. Is this not the welcome you want from God? Is this not how you want to be treated when you get to heaven, when you die? This is what Jesus is trying to communicate. Why is this story so powerful? Because it's our story. It's my story. I grew up poor. I grew up messing up my life. I got involved in drugs. I was running around with gang members. I carried a gun in high school. I got beat up so many times. Then I started beating up people. I was the prodigal son. That was me. I knew that I was not right. I was a slave to my own anger, my own hatred. I was surrounded by violence. I had horrible things happen that I internalized and turned into anger. I saw my brother killed right in front of me. I saw my, I heard about my uncle who was like my dad. I, I had to bury my mom, my father, all because of violence. And I was trapped in the anger and hatred. Till this sophomore sitting in front of me named Jeff Chacon invited me to church. And I went to the Bible talk and it was the parable of the sower. And I hung my head at the end because I knew I was, I was wrong. I was far from God. And I didn't even really know the Father. And I studied the Bible and I got to know the Father. I came home and 10 days later I was baptized. You know, he goes up to him and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth. 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And it wasn't until I stopped lying to myself and I could turn myself in. But the father said to his servants, quick, this is our God. Quick, bring the best robe, put it on his, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. What makes God happy? What makes God fired up? You with him. You close to him. You not letting anything pull you away from him. You knowing him, if you, and if you didn't know him when you were little, or you didn't get taught about him, then you humbling yourself and asking somebody for help so you can know him, so you can come home. There's a classic old Spanish story. A young boy gets in a fight with his dad. He's like 11 or 12, becoming a young man. And as many boys becoming young men, they want to assert themselves and they want to challenge dad. And he got in a horrible fight with his dad and he ran away to the big city. And his dad was hurting over him. And he prayed for him and he worried about him. And he, he, he took everything he had, he sold it, and he traveled to the big city of Madrid and he, and he bought an announcement in the newspaper. His son's name was Francisco or Paco. And the, and the newspaper just simply said, Paco, all is forgiven. Please come home. Meet me in the plaza Saturday, 12 o'clock. And come Saturday, the dad goes to the plaza. And yeah, he found his son, but there was about 50 other little boys there hoping to find their dads. Because we belong with the Father. We belong with God. You belong with God. You know, we all know John 3:16. The verse after that is good too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There will be a day when Jesus comes to judge the world, the living and the dead. And it'll be too late for studies, for repentance, for coming home parties. But we're in the time right now. when Jesus came to save us. We're in the time where you can be forgiven of anything. We're in the time of compassion, of grace, of mercy. So come home. You know God's talking to you. I don't know what he's saying to you, but I know he's saying something to you. Don't plug your ears. Don't cover your ears. Listen to him. Whether it's just getting open about some sin in your life or getting help with some addiction or getting serious about your relationship with God. Just do it. Reach out. Get help. Take advantage of the time. A lot of great things can happen even in the middle of a crisis. God moves powerfully. God bless you and have a great day and a great week. Let's pray as we get ready to take communion. Our Father God, we are so grateful for your welcome. We're so grateful for accepting us all into your family and being our dad. And we know, Father, that even this story doesn't cover everything because you also went to the cross for us. You also paid for our ticket home. You also paid to remove the barrier between us and you so that we can be with you. You shed your blood so there'd be nothing between us. So as we eat this bread and as we drink this cup, help us to understand what it represents, Father, and how wonderful it is, God, that you love us this much, that you care this much about each and every one of us. We thank you and we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Thank you.